There is absolutely no nutrient, no protein, no vitamin, no mineral, no nothing found in meats and dairy products that you cannot obtain on a plant-based foods. Consider the biggest animals on the planet, elephants and buffaloes and giraffes. These are vegetarian animals. They grow to thousands of pounds of muscle and bone without ever eating cheeseburgers and pepperoni pizzas. We can do the same. We can certainly uh, build our 140 pounds or whatever it is you need to build in your body. The human body has absolutely no nutritional requirements for animal flesh. If you open up Harrison's textbook of internal medicine, you will find no disease listed acute cow flesh deficiency. And there is no chronic chicken flesh deficiency. There is no such disease because we have no need for these substances whatsoever. Animal fats, they clog you up and they make you fat. Two good reasons not to eat them. Here's a couple of more. Now, I'm describing problems with eating animal flesh. They have too much fat, and that includes chicken and fish. Uh, fish has a tremendous amount of fat and cholesterol in it. And chicken flesh is very fatty food. If you ever watch your mother make chicken soup, you ever see all that fat that rises up to the top there? Well, don't kid yourself that chicken is lean meat. It is not. There's just as much fat and cholesterol in chicken as there is in beef. Animal muscle is animal muscle. And when you eat it, it raises the level of fat in your blood. Animal fat comes in three flavors in the North American diet. It comes in the form of red meat, and the fat is in the meat. It is in the fibers of the animal's muscle. And just trimming off the white fat around the edge of the steak really does not lower the fat and cholesterol content significantly of the meat. So red meat is the number one source of fat and cholesterol in the North American diet. The second is the yolk of hen's eggs. The egg of a chicken is meant to hatch baby chicks. And it, the yolk of the hen's egg is one of the most concentrated globs of fat and cholesterol on the planet. It is made to power that baby chicken for 21 days with no other energy. And when you run egg yolks through your bloodstream, you turn your blood fatty, just like Mr. Phillips. And the third source of fat in the North American diet comes from that white fluid that comes out of the udder of a cow. Now, cow's milk is a high-fat fluid exquisitely designed for turning a 65-pound calf into a 400-pound cow in a year. That is what cow's milk is for. Now, the it, it, whole milk has a butterfat content of 3%. That's the cream that rises up to the top. And you eat, you drink a 3% solution of butterfat, you're going to turn your blood fatty, as will a 2 and 1% solution of butterfat. But at the dairy, the butter fat is skimmed off and they concentrate it into huge vats, half the size of this room. And they concentrate the fat to 50, 60, 80, 90 percent fat. This stuff is so thick you can walk across it. Why do they do that? Well, they do that so you will buy it and eat it. Uh, the, the butter fat is mixed up with uh, air until it hardens into chunks called butter. The butter fat is uh, mixed with sugar and frozen and sold as ice cream. The butter fat is mixed up with cocoa powder and uh, sugar and sold as milk chocolate. The butter fat is mixed up with bacteria and allowed to ferment until it turns into sour cream. A lower fat version is called yogurt. And the butter fat is mixed up with calf's stomach and, uh, and bacteria and allowed to ferment for about six weeks till it hardens into chunks called cheese. These are all forms of butter fat. The folks at the dairy want you to buy the butter fat and eat it. And when you do, you turn your blood fat. There's absolutely no reason to run butter fat through your bloodstream at any time, and I'm submitting to you that you'll be a lot healthier and happier if you do not. Cow's milk is for baby calves. You have no more need of cow's milk than you knew giraffe milk or horse milk or rat milk. We took Mr. Phillips down to the operating room, and I gave him a thousand micrograms of fentanyl and put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest and opened up his aorta and opened up his coronary arteries. And what, he, what the surgeons started pulling out of Mr. Phillips' arteries were great, long, yellow, greasy, sausage-like uh, formations of fat that look like this. This is the number one cause of death of people in North America. Every 30 seconds on this continent, Canada included, somebody grabs their chest and falls over with a heart attack. This is animal fat clogging up the arteries. When you send this material down to the pathologist and you ask him to analyze it, the report always comes back the same saturated fat and cholesterol. It's animal fat. The pathology report never, ever, ever contains the words remnants of broccoli, rice, and tofu. <laughs> it's animal fat. The good news is when you stop running animal fat through your bloodstream, this stuff melts away. This stuff will come off the artery walls and arteries can open up. This atherosclerotic material clogs arteries all over the body. It's just a matter of which artery to which organ clogs up first that gives you the symptoms. If the yellow atherosclerotic fat builds up in an artery going up to the brain, you will suffer a stroke. 
If it clogs an artery going to your kidney, you'll suffer kidney failure or high blood pressure. If the atherosclerotic material accumulates on the walls of large blood vessels, like the aorta that takes blood from the heart down to the abdomen and legs, the artery walls become damaged and weaken. They lose their strength. And the high pressure in the blood vessel causes the artery to balloon out, forming an aneurysm, which can then rupture, leading to emergency surgery or death. People, this is all the same disease. We are talking about animal fat, essentially clogging up the arteries throughout the body. And it's the number one cause of death and disability in North America. And this is essentially a disease of people who eat animals and the products made from animals. You almost never see these diseases in pure vegetarians. And William Castelli, the doctor who runs the Framingham Heart Study, says he has never seen a heart attack in anybody with a cholesterol below 150. And there's good reason for that. When you draw blood into a glass tube and let it sit there for an hour, it separates out into two parts, and the red clot settles to the bottom, and the liquid part of the blood, the serum, rises up to the top. Here you see two tubes of blood, and the tube on the left is normal, serum, is normal blood. Here you see the dark red clot, and this golden yellow liquid, this is normal serum. This is what your blood is supposed to look like. But I looked at Mr. Phillips' tube, and it was just shocking. The serum floating in his tube was thick and greasy white. It looked like Elmer's glue. It stuck to the sides of the tube when I shook it. I went back into the room. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a double cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized what I was looking at was all the fat in the beef burger and the butter fat and the cheese and the butter fat and the ice cream and the butter fat and the milk had oozed out into his blood and turned his blood fat. It's a well-known clinical phenomenon. It's called lipemia, and it happens every time you eat a fatty meal, you turn your blood fatty. And your blood stays this way for four hours until your liver can clear it out of the bloodstream. If you are like most North Americans and eat bacon and eggs for breakfast and a cheeseburger for lunch and fried chicken for dinner and ice cream for dessert, you're keeping your blood fatty all day. The stuff never clears out of the bloodstream. You keep your blood fatty for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. What do you think is going to happen to the arteries carrying all that fat? I will show you what happens to the arteries carrying all that fat in a few minutes. But it's a disaster. Consider how much animal flesh uh, most North Americans eat. In their lifetime, the average meat-eating American is going to eat 15 cows. Oh, <laughs> going to eat 24 hogs. Eat 12 sheep. She will eat 900 chickens and 1,000 pounds of assorted animals that either swam in the water or flew in the air. That is a tremendous amount of animal flesh to be pouring through the human bloodstream year after year. No wonder we wind up with clogged arteries and high blood pressure and cancers and a lot of other diseases. And I'll show you how those two are related. In fact, animal fats are solid at body temperature. If you're in a kitchen on a summer day and you've got a piece of T-bone steak on the counter and it's 98.6 degrees out, the same as your body temperature, the fat on that beef steak is solid. It's a nice white chunk sitting there. If you have a bottle of olive oil on the same table at that same temperature, it's liquid at that same body temperature. I don't know about you, but I don't want to eat any fat that is solid at my body temperature because it's going to start clogging up my arteries. And that's the beauty of plant oils. They're liquid at your body temperature. They really don't cling to your arteries. The other thing about fats is make you fat. Animal fats stick to you. When you eat fats of animals, those fats wash through your bloodstream, and as they cross the, um, as they flow through your fat stores under your skin, they stick there. You've got fat cells looking for pre-made fats, and you eat the fat of animals, they stick there. What you see hanging on this man's abdomen really isn't even his fat. That is the fat of all the cows and pigs and chickens and ducks and turkeys and other slow animals that were walking past his table when he had a fork in his hand. <laughs> Not his fat. The good news is, if he changes his diet and starts eating rice and vegetables and, uh, and good plant-based foods, this stuff melts away and people get leaner. It certainly happened to me. Now, when I was in medical school, I never heard the words too much protein. I thought the more protein, the better. Put them on a high-protein diet, make them strong. Ain't so. You better believe there's such a thing called too much protein, and most North Americans suffer from it. First of all, what is protein? Protein is the building block material that you use to make the hard structures of your body. Your fingernails are made of protein, your hair is made of protein, your bones are made of protein. It's the brick of our bodies, a solid substance. 
Now, you don't need very much protein during the day. You only need about 30 grams of protein a day. That's the weight of 10 pennies, okay? Imagine 10 pennies in your hand, that's how much protein you need. But look how much protein the typical North American consumes. <clears throat> On a typical North American eating day, a typical American who has bacon and eggs for breakfast and a glass of milk, who has a cheeseburger and milkshake lunch, and has a beefsteak dinner with a glass of milk and some ice cream for dessert, is clipping along at 150 grams of protein. That is a five-day supply of protein. That is too much protein. Why? Because your body can't store protein. You can store fats, you can store carbohydrates, you can't store protein. So what happens? Well, your liver starts breaking down that protein, and as it metabolizes it, it releases all sorts of, of toxic nitrogen-containing wastes like urea and ammonia and amino acid fragments. And these have a detrimental effect on the body, because as all these amino acid wastes go through your kidneys, it makes you lose calcium out of your urine. Why does that happen? Because there's fundamental differences between animal protein and plant protein. And I'm talking about the protein in meats and dairy products. Animal proteins contain amino acids that have sulfur. And sulfur makes extra acid in the body. And as acids wash through the bone, they dissolve calcium out of the bones. Plants have much less acid. Animal protein is very concentrated. The muscle of an animal is the most concentrated protein on the planet. And so there's a big bolt of protein that goes into your bloodstream as soon as you eat it. Plant protein is mixed up with fiber. When you eat whole grain rice or whole grain um, uh, barley, it takes hours for that to be absorbed into your bloodstream. The absorption time is much, much slower. So the less acid nature of plant protein and its slower absorption rate means it's much gentler in the body and it doesn't pull calcium out of your body. That's a very significant phenomenon. The phenomenon of protein pulling calcium out of your body is appropriately called protein-induced protein-induced, hypercalciuria, too much calcium going out in the urine. What I'm saying is, and it's well documented, when you eat a big bolt of animal protein, whether it be red meat or chicken or fish or even milk, the acid nature of the protein washes through the bones, dissolves the calcium, which then goes out in the urine. And what I'm telling you is that every time you eat a piece of chicken, and every time you eat a piece of fish, ladies, for the next three or four hours, you urinate calcium out of your body down the toilet. And the investigators who documented this many times clearly say that high-protein diets cause a negative calcium balance, even in the presence of more than adequate dietary calcium. Even if you are taking calcium tablets and drinking milk, protein is such a potent yanker outer of calcium out of your body that you will not be able to keep up with the calcium loss. Does that ring a bell with anybody? It did with the investigators. They said that osteoporosis, thin, crumbly bones that fracture easily, would seem to be an inevitable outcome of continued consumption of a high-protein diet. In our society, we are told that the cause of osteoporosis is not chewing up enough calcium tablets or not drinking enough cow's milk. And you're really, thought to, you're really told to believe this. There's a lot of medical evidence that says this just is not so. It's really becoming apparent that osteoporosis seems to be not so much a disease of calcium deficiency, it's a disease of protein excess. You see osteoporosis in the countries that consume the most protein, in the United States, in Scandinavia, in Europe, and in Australia. That's where you see osteoporosis. You don't see it in China, you don't see it in rural South America, you don't see it in rural Asia, where people are eating grains and vegetables. And I'll tell you, dairy products are no protection against osteoporosis because the Americans and the Canadians and the Scandinavians are the people who drink more milk and eat more cheese than anybody else on planet Earth, and they have the worst osteoporosis on the planet. And if dairy, protein, if dairy products protected you from osteoporosis, you wouldn't see it in North America, and you see just the opposite, because there's so much protein in dairy products that it actually puts you in negative calcium balance, makes you urinate out your calcium, and Dr. Recker's study clearly showed this. They gave women three eight-ounce glasses of milk a day for a year, and they were still in negative calcium balance because there's so much protein in milk. Don't rely on dairy products for your, for your calcium. Get it out of grains and greens and fruits and vegetables, but most important, hold on to your calcium by getting all that chicken and fish flesh out of your kidneys and out of your body and out of your bones. Why does all this happen? Good heavens, what a set of catastrophes to fall on you just because you want a cheeseburger for lunch. That doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, uh, to me it seems pretty logical because our digestive system simply is not that of a mountain lion. We are not carnivores no matter how you look at it. 
In fact, if you compare the digestive system, why we are far more like the herbivore than the carnivore. If you look at the mountain lion, you'll see that the jaw joint is an up and down vertical hinge. Uh, jaws of your house cat and mountain lions open up and down like a trap door. They cannot chew from side to side if they wanted to because their jaw joint won't permit it. Horses, uh, antelope on the other hand, have nice sliding jaw joints that permit them to chew in a rotary motion. And that works very nicely with their flat grinding molar teeth in the back of their lower jaw, which allows them to grind up grains and greens and grasses. That is exactly the same arrangement that you and I have. We have nice sliding jaw joints and flat grinding molar teeth. The back teeth of your house cat or a mountain lion are overlapping shearing fangs for Terry's flesh. We really don't have carnivorous teeth. The stomach acid of a mountain lion is 20 times more concentrated than that of either a horse or a man because mountain lions are digesting flesh, which is protein that needs a lot of acid. These animals are digesting carbohydrates that require a lot less acid to digest. And finally, the mark of the intestine is a very key differentiating point. Whoever designed the mountain lion seemed to know again that when meat sits in the colon, it breaks down into carcinogens. And those cats do not want that meat sitting in the bowel for very long. And on, on a mountain lion, the intestine is 12 feet and out. It's time to move that stuff right out. The, that's a mark of a carnivore. The herbivores have the opposite situation. Horses and antelopes and gazelles are chewing up plant fiber all day. Their enzymes need a long time to break down all the plant fiber. So it's an herbivore's interest to have a great long intestine. And herbivores do, and so do we. If you were the size of a horse, your intestines would be one and a half times the length of a horse's intestine. We have great long and herbivorous intestines, not very much acid in the stomach, flat grinding molar teeth, and sliding jaw joints. We are way more designed like an herbivore than a carnivore. Now, I'm not saying we are complete herbivores, and we do have the ability to digest small amounts of meat. I believe that's an emergency ration uh, to get us through times of, fa of famine. Now, when I make these comparisons, inevitably, somebody points to their canine teeth in their upper jaw, and they say, aha, what about these? Why were we given sharp teeth like this if we weren't supposed to be eating meat? To that, I can only reply that these canine teeth in our upper jaw work very well for biting into apples and bananas and potatoes, but they really aren't carnivorous teeth. If you want to see what a set of real carnivorous teeth look like, here they are. If you look in the mirror at your own teeth, you'll find that your canines are shorter than your central incisors. They just don't work well 